This is your news source evening bulletin for today, Tuesday, the 17th day of May in the year 2022. I'm Gordon Mosley reporting, and here's what we're tracking tonight. The opposition APNU AFC today called on the government to return to the table and start fresh, broad based consultation on the reform of the country's electoral laws. According to the opposition, the government must face the reality that the nation has rejected both its amendments to the Representation of the People's Act and its public consultations on electoral reform. The government last week announced that it has started public consultations on the proposed electoral reform, but those consultations have been confined to a few groups. Opposition Member of Parliament Gita Chandan Edmund said the government's approach fails to address key systematic and structural flaws. As such, the PPP totally fails to address key systemic and structural flaws and weaknesses in our electoral system. It totally avoids any consideration of major constitutional, statutory, administrative, operational, and technological reforms. In fact, the PPPC's approach seems more likely to make free and fair and uncontested in elections in Guyana more elusive. So for the sake of the country, we can, we must, and we have to do better. We need all stakeholders to participate and be satisfied that we have improved the system and we have prepared the basis for free and fair elections. The opposition has not made any submissions since the government opened the process for written submissions last November. And today, opposition leader Aubrey Norton said the opposition was not avoiding making submissions, but it did not want the process to be seen as a political one. And so it gives civil society groups a chance to make submissions. Chandon Edmund also shared similar views. For the opposition, local, regional and national elections must meet three objectives. The first being only eligible persons must be registered. Secondly, results must accurately reflect the will of those who have voted. And thirdly, every step of the election process, that is the registration, production of voters lists, voting and counting, and tabulation and the declaration of results, it must win the trust. It must win the trust and the confidence of the public, participating parties and other relevant stakeholders. Additionally, the opposition is maintaining that a comprehensive electoral reform must rest on four pillars, which include a thorough review by GCOM of its performance in managing recent elections, national consultations involving the public, civil society, and the parliamentary political parties, as well as an in-depth involvement of experts on electoral laws, electoral systems, elections technologies, and elections management. The opposition says it anticipates no difficulty in the government recruiting such expertise given the international support for electoral reform in the country and holistic constitutional and legislative amendments or enactments. The opposition also said it is ready to sit and meet with the government to start ironing out the reforms that are needed to reform the country's electoral system. More news coming up in just a moment. How fast is fiber? Think fast. GGT Fiber has three packages with download speeds of 50, 100, and 150 megabits per second. That's fast enough to stream movies and music, to chat with Gran and Fran, to study, and more. What would you do? Upgrade to GTT Fiber today and don't get left behind tomorrow. Atlanta is a big bad city for his motion out the GT. Don't forget the 29 to be we got in Bliss Land. Yeah. Atlanta we say City Vice Mushi Live and also gonna do some covers like Bra Baba Bye. Must get a thing, 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 must get a thing. How we out a GT. All of the girl, them a wine and shake. Guy and this woman, them a number one. Yo, 
Flash back, we said. Bliss Launch 2090 B. Atlanta City Vice Machine. I keep my name out to We've got exciting news. All 12 ounce yellow cap Buster are now only $100. Buster, live in Come full get color. your Buster. President Irfan Ali and Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Kit Rowley, met and held bilateral talks this afternoon at State House. Moments after the Prime Minister arrived in the country, ahead of the Regional Agriculture Forum and Exhibition, which opens on Thursday at the Arthur Chung Convention Center. According to a statement from Prime Minister Rowley's team, the two leaders engaged in broad, extensive bilateral talks, and they also pledged to deepen ties between Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago. It was explained that the discussions focused specifically on agriculture, energy, and national security. A memorandum of understanding covering the key issues which were discussed is to be signed and released. The Trinidadian Prime Minister was accompanied by his Foreign Affairs Minister Dr. Amory Brown, Agriculture Minister Kazim Hossein, and Minister in the Ministry of Agriculture Avinash Singh. President Irfan Ali was accompanied by the Minister responsible for Finance Dr. Ashni Singh, Minister of Agriculture Zulfikar Mustafa, Tourism, Industry and Commerce Minister Onej Waldron, Home Affairs Minister Robson Ben, and Foreign Affairs Secretary Robert Posada. Gayan and Trinidad and Tobago have been seeking to iron out relations following a tit-for-tat spat between the two countries after Vice President Bharat Changdeo described the neighboring Twin Island Republic as a country that was falling apart. That statement by Changdeo resulted in an official rebuke from the Trinidadian government, with the country's foreign affairs minister writing Gayan's foreign minister on the issue. Mr. Changdeo was not present at any of the meetings today with the Trinidadian Prime Minister. Let's tell you now that the government has tabled the Industrial Hemp Bill, which was read for the first time this morning by Agriculture Minister Zulfikar Mustafa in the National Assembly. Once passed, the legislation will provide for the cultivation and manufacturing of industrial hemp and hemp-related products in the country. However, the government maintains that the cultivation of hemp will be done in an orderly and structured way. In keeping with that position, the proposed legislation explains that a person shall not cultivate or manufacture industrial hemp and hemp-related products or conduct research on industrial hemp or any other activity concerning or related to industrial hemp without a license issued by the authority under the Act. The authority will be the Industrial Hemp Regulatory Authority, with its establishment also being proposed under the bill. It will be administered by a governing seven-member board that will oversee its work. Additionally, a license will also have to be issued for any research to be done on the cultivation of industrial hemp or the manufacturing of related products. The bill is also proposing a hefty fine and jail time of one year for persons who contravene that provision. Last month, Vice President Bharat Jagdew announced that the government has earmarked regions 6 and 10 for the cultivation of industrial hemp. Since then, citizens from other regions have shown an interest in the agricultural venture and have even protested for the government to extend the initiative to other regions. But the government in the proposed legislation has said the process will not be a willy-nilly one, noting that a person licensed to cultivate industrial hemp shall not plant any seed or plant or harvest any cannabis plant before a sample of the seed or plant is analyzed by an analyst to ascertain whether it confirms with the THC concentration allowed under the Act. A license to cultivate industrial hemp will approve all activities related to the cultivation of industrial hemp, including the possession, planting, propagating, harvesting, transporting, distribution, and selling of industrial hemp and seed. Hemp is a botanical class of cannabis sativa, which is grown specifically for industrial or medicinal use. 
The Minister of Housing and Water, Colin Kroll, announced in the National Assembly this morning that the government is on track to reach its five-year goal for the allocation of 50,000 house lots. In opening a debate on the condominium bill, which seeks to regularize condominium housing options, Minister Kroll said 11,000 house lots have already been allocated in the past two years. Mr. Speaker, house lots allocation targets for 2020 and 2021 are already surpassed and we will do the same for 2022. In fact, we have allocated over 11,000 house lots to date. Further, as we speak, more than 1,100 houses are being built in eight housing areas across the country, 300 of which are already handed over to the homeowners. The housing minister said his ministry is actively pursuing the acquisition of new lands as well as developmental works in areas to clear the way for the distribution of new house lots as the demand for housing remains high. Our government recognizes that housing is not just about providing a roof or room for someone. We know that adequate housing can be a deterrent to crime and an incentive for education. When we improve the conditions under which our people live, whether through direct poverty reduction interventions or subsidized housing, we raise the well-being of the entire country. Opposition Member of Parliament Annette Ferguson, who once served as Minister Responsible for Housing under the former APNU AFC government, said while the current government continues to boast about its achievements in the housing sector, the nation should be reminded that the foundation was set by the previous government. But Mr. Speaker, I need to remind the honorable members across the aisle to go to the areas in Diamond. Go to the areas in, in perfect harmony. Go to the areas in Providence. Schemes that were developed under that administration post May 11, 2015. See the state of those areas now. Last evening, President Irfanali acknowledged that many house lot owners have been finding it difficult to start a construction of their homes. He has announced that the government will be setting up a new housing unit that will seek to assist many of those first-time home builders with their construction plans. Well, the leader of the opposition, Aubrey Norton, wants to see the government put together a more holistic relief plan that will cater to all citizens and cushion the effects of the rising cost of living in the country. During a press conference this morning, Mr. Norton said there is a need for a better relief package and not just the one-off cash grants that may only provide temporary relief to some citizens. Our people need relief. Our people must get relief, should get relief, but the government's approach is not one aimed at giving relief that will uh, improve the quality of the life of the people. It is one-off cash grants uh, that create conditions that are fertile for corruption rather than solving the problems of the people. On Monday, the president announced a one-off $25,000 cash grant for residents of Riverin and Hinterland communities only. The opposition leader said he would like more information to be provided on the mechanism to be used and put in place by the government to ensure accountability in the distribution of the cash grants. Mr. Norton said there have been numerous cases in the past under the government whereby persons who were not entitled to cash grants still received, while those in need were left empty-handed. He said the distribution of the cash grants must be done in a structured way to avoid corruption. First of all, there is no data provided on how many households we have. Then secondly, since we recall from practice that they, that they on the one hand say households, but when they actually proceed to implement, they then start to ask people for transport, etc., and evidence that they own the property in areas where the opposition control we have no doubt that they will go down the same path of marginalizing and discriminating against people they perceive not to be supportive of them. And the opposition leader also noted that long-term relief measures need to be implemented to assist those most in need. Look, we have no problem with the government giving resources to people in riverine areas. 
but that alone will not solve the problem. As it relates to the government removal of the value-added tax on several items, the opposition leader observed that those benefits will only be enjoyed by businesses, since the relief in that regard never reaches the ordinary man. After initially backing the incumbent Commonwealth Secretary General Patricia Scott Lennon Dominica for a second term as Secretary General, the 15-member Caribbean community CARICOM is now allowing member states to vote for a candidate of their choice. CARICOM's new position followed the entry of the Jamaican Foreign Minister Kamina Johnson in the race for the top Commonwealth job. While the incumbent Secretary General was hoping that a Jamaican candidate was going to pull out of the race, the government of Jamaica has started an aggressive campaign across the Commonwealth to get its candidate elected. In a statement today, the CARICOM Chairman and Prime Minister of Belize, John Bassano, said the Conference of Heads of Government of CARICOM maintains that it is still the turn of the Caribbean to provide a candidate for the position of Commonwealth Secretary General. And in that regard, two candidates from the Caribbean community have been nominated for the post and member states of the community will vote for the candidate of their choice. Some CARICOM member states had initially criticized the move by Jamaica to submit a candidate for the position. But the Jamaican government has defended its decision and has pointed to the concerns of Scotland's leadership of the Commonwealth during her first term. Members of the Commonwealth will gather in Rwanda in June for their heads of government meeting and the election of a new Commonwealth Secretary General. Six months after that fire that gutted a section of the police headquarters which housed the Office of Professional Responsibility, the Ghana Fire Service is still to release the findings of its investigations, although the probe was completed months ago. And Monday, as the acting fire chief Gregory Wickham was overlooking the fire service dowsing another blaze in another section of the police headquarters, he was questioned by news source about the probe into the previous incident. The fire chief said while the investigation has been completed, there is still a procedure that needs to be followed before the release of the findings. Yes, well, I'm certain the investigation was completed, but the information as it relates to the cause of that fire, I am not in a position to relate that at this moment. Why not? Just because procedures that follow. Further pressed about the long time that it has taken the fire service to make its findings public, the fire chief maintained that there are still procedures that ought to be followed before the release, while not indicating the type of procedures. I wouldn't want to say that we are in the back foot, and particularly because of this fire, the fire that you're referring to, but there are procedures that need to be followed. Investigative work are always, uh, sometimes the investigators come up with the cause of the fire very early, and then there are other times when they are uh, system that need to be followed it may take a little longer to come up with the cause of the fire as so opposed. generally there's no time limit or time span given as to when the cause of a fire should be established but mr wickham denied that he has been prevented from releasing the findings of the report and he insisted that the fire department will release the information regarding the cause of that fire Musos understands that the preliminary investigations into the fire ruled out arson as investigators found evidence linking the start of the fire to electrical wiring problems that existed in the building. Six persons, including two young children, were injured today when the driver of the car that they were in lost control and flipped off the Linden Suze Lake Highway. A police report indicated that the accident occurred at around 11.40 this morning along the highway in the vicinity of the village of Yarrow Cabra. The driver of the car, Paul Arch, was proceeding north along the highway at a fast rate of speed when he reportedly lost control of the car and it flipped over several times, coming to a stop on the grass carpet of the highway, according to the police report. The driver and the five other occupants, including a four-year-old and a one-year-old, were removed from the wreckage and rushed to the Diamond Hospital. The injured adults have been identified as Ayanna Liddell, David Ward and Mitchell Peters. The driver and two of the passengers have since been discharged, while the other three persons were transferred to the George Young Hospital for additional medical attention. An investigation into the accident has been launched. Five weeks after the brutal murder of 57-year-old East Coast of Marama resident Savitri Raj, the lifeless body of her husband, who was the only suspect in the murder, has been found. The partly decomposed body of 56-year-old Vijamal Raj was found on Monday afternoon in the Enmore backlands. The discovery was made by a cattle farmer who was grazing his cattle in the area. The farmer told police that he discovered the man's body after spotting a mosquito netting in the bush. 
Two bottles with a suspected poisonous substance were discovered close to the body. Police suspect that he may have died a few days ago after hiding out in the backlands for several weeks. The dead man's son was summoned and he was able to positively identify the body. It was the same son who was at the family home back in April when he heard his mother's screams and saw his father running away from the house, leaving the woman behind with multiple stab wounds. She died at the scene. The suspect was not seen since the murder. Yo, Atlanta is a big bad city for his mission out the GG. Don't forget the 2090 baby guy in Bliss Land. Yeah. Atlanta we said City Vice Mushi Live in us. We're gonna do some covers like Bra ba ba bye. Must get a ting ting ting. Must get a ting. How we out a GT. All of the guys, them are white and shake the Guyanese woman, them are number one. Yo, flashback we said. Bliss Lodge 2090 baby. Atlanta City Vice Mushi Live. Tip my name out to know. Have you heard the news? The CPL is back. Done! Oh, yes! It's the finals coming to Guyana. Absolutely brilliant! It's going to be a carnival of cricket. It's going to be a carnival of cricket. It's going to be a carnival of cricket. This are not talking about a fly nor no bees No girl can whine like Guyanese Watch the young them a do it in a circle Guyanese girls them a dance in a circle so Hear me and say no make a banter You know a sound boy killer represent The golden smile family You know say a flashback to a school party You know say oh the vibe is plenty Slow down fix, 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 fix. We've got exciting news All 12 ounce yellow cap buster are now only $100 Buster live in Come get color. your buster Super 95 gasoline gives you more reasons to drive and is available at 56 service stations nationwide. For affordable price, high performance, and high mileage, choose Guyol's Super 95 gasoline. Across the region tonight, U.S. officials have announced plans to ease tough sanctions imposed on Cuba by former President Donald Trump. Under new measures approved by the Biden administration, restrictions on family remittances and travel to the island will be eased. The processing of U.S. visas for Cubans will also be speeded up. State Department spokesman Ned Price said the move would allow Cuban citizens to pursue a life free from government oppression. The loosening of sanctions will see a cap on family remittances, which are funds sent by migrants in the U.S. and family members back in Cuba, removed. Previously, migrants were prevented from sending more than 1,000 U.S. dollars every three months. Donations to non-family members will also be permitted under the new plans. But U.S. officials emphasize that they will seek to ensure such payments don't reach those who perpetrate human rights abuses by using civilian electronic payment processors. They also said that no bodies will be removed from the Cuban restricted list, a State Department register of companies linked to the communist government in Havana, with whom U.S. citizens are barred from doing business. The U.S. has barred Guatemala's Attorney General Consuelo Porras from entering the country, accusing her of being involved in corruption. 
The U.S. State Department said Ms. Porras had repeatedly obstructed and undermined anti-corruption investigations in Guatemala. Ms. Porras has denied any wrongdoing and said that fighting corruption has been her priority. On Monday, she was sworn in for a second four-year term in office. As he reappointed her, Guatemalan President Alejandro Gometei described Ms. Porras as a professional who meets all the constitutional requirements to serve another term as the Attorney General of Guatemala. And finally tonight, international news. Spain has approved a draft bill that would remove the requirement for 16 and 17-year-old girls to have parental consent before terminating a pregnancy. The new bill is aimed at reforming a previous abortion law approved by the Conservative People's Party in 2015. Government spokeswoman Isabel Rodriguez said the bill represented a new step forward for democracy. If the bill is approved, Spain will become the first country in Europe to offer its workers paid menstrual leave. In Spain, voluntary abortion is allowed up until the 14th week of pregnancy. But doctors in traditionally Roman Catholic Spain will still be able to sign up to a register of conscientious objectors. And that's your News Source Evening Bulletin for tonight. I'm Gordon Mosley, reporting and encouraging you to stay safe.